Thank you. Thank you to the chairs, the organizing committee, uh, and the CCFA for the invitation. Um, my morning was spent with multiple flight delays, so I'm thrilled to be here on time. Uh, but thinking back, last year I lost my wedding ring on the flight, and then I spilled my coffee on the guy next to me looking for my ring. So this was a much better day for me so far, so I'm hoping that trend continues. I have a few disclosures. What I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to start off kind of setting the stage. Just a brief two to three minutes about what's the standard of care in imaging and IBD. I'll talk briefly about the benefits and then about CT and MRE, where are we now as far as them being interchangeable or equivalent. And then we'll segue into appropriate as well as inappropriate applications. We'll look at some data about how we're doing and I'll close with some new developments which I think are quite exciting. Well, I think the first concept that we've all come to appreciate, uh, symptoms aren't enough. There's multiple studies out, he out there. Here's one from Jennifer Jones and colleagues. And this looked at correlations between a, a multitude of markers. In this study, it was high sensitivity CRP, IL-6, calprotectin, lactoferrin, and CDAI, or the Crohn's Disease Activity Index, a, a clinical scoring system. And what you can see, if you follow this over to the last column, the correlation was poor. It was not significant between the endoscopic scoring system, the SESCD, as well as the CDAI. And I think we see, see that in our practice every day. We see patients with symptoms that don't correlate with activity. We see patients who have responded to therapy that don't seem to improve. And I think it's all pushed us to say we need objective measures. Well, we're, in we're, we're gastroenterologists, we do endoscopy. Why not just scope our patients, it's what we do. And, and I won't beleaguer this point, uh, Dr. Wolf already talked about this a little bit. Um, Dr. Samuel, Sunil Samuel, when he was with us, looked at patients who had a, a normal ileoscopy were felt to have active disease. And again, the point is, there's a significant proportion that you may miss if you don't image these patients, whether it's intramural disease, upper gut disease, or patients who have skipping. And then the last point, before I get to that, this is a nice example from the study. This was actually a patient with a normal ileoscopy and had normal biopsies. And what you can see if you look down there to the TI, the arrows point that out for you. You'll see enhancement, thickening, there's a suggestion of the comb sign, which is dilatation of the vasa recta to that segment of bowel. Not many here are radiologists, but I think most of us appreciate that's a floridly abnormal loop of bowel. This is a patient with active disease, and we would have missed that, even if we had biopsies of that segment. In addition to providing information about extent severity of disease, imaging also allows us to pick up penetrating disease complications. Um, this is similar to information we've gotten from emergency room settings where patients have been imaged. I think we've all been impressed by this. Your patients who come in who get cross-sectional imaging, this was a tertiary care center, almost 350 consecutive patients. One in five, about 20% had penetrating disease, a new finding in more than 50%. And, and that's what imaging brings to the table. It not only allows you the full extent of disease, it also picks up penetrating disease, it'll also give you extra intestinal disease manifestations. Does it matter? None of this really matters at the end of the day if you're going to treat your patients the same way anyhow. If you're going to use the same drugs, maybe you say it doesn't matter if I'm missing a little more proximal disease. But multiple studies now suggest it does change how we take care of our patients. There's now data from MR enterography as well as capsule endoscopy, and it looks pretty similar. This was a prospective study in more than 250 patients, and the clinicians filled out their management plan prior to CT enterography and after. And what you can see up here, highlighted now in yellow, you know, 50% of patients roughly with both suspected as well as established disease, CT did lead to management changes. It changed level of confidence for active inflammation, penetrating disease, as well as strictures. With that being said, before we move on, can we assume then that we can either do CT or MR? And the caveat is, yes, most of the time. There's some subtle differences that I'll talk about. But I think we've gotten to the point in 2013, 2014, that good quality MR in our patients for active disease, CT and MR seem to have similar operating characteristics. This is a patient in one of our studies who had both CT and MRE. You can see down in the right-handed quadrant, there's evidence of 
Crohn's disease, there's tethered loops of bowel, there's evidence of thickening as well as enhancement. Well, how about the differences? And I bring this up because when we talk about appropriate or inappropriate use, I think it's the nuances of the techniques, the technologies that push us one way or another when deciding what's best for our patients. The advantages of CTE include less inner observer variability, higher image quality, shorter acquisition times, five minutes, maybe as low as two to three minutes compared to up to 45 minutes for MR enterography. Cost, and I'll come back to that, but it can be anywhere between $1,000 to $1,500 in the United States. There's access issues. All of you have seen it's much easier in the middle of the night to get a CT, maybe not an interrography, but a CT even in the ER setting than it is to try and get an MR. And then there's a potential to do things like bone assessments, which I'll come back to. Advantages of MR enterography include the absence of ionizing radiation exposure. You can get multiple phases, and what I mean by that, if you see a loop of bowel that it's concerning for a stricture, you can actually in real time take a look at that loop and see with peristalsis if things open up. That's not something you would want or readily be able to do with CT. It may be superior for the detection of fibrosis. Um, it looks, it is better for perianal disease. And then pregnancy and renal insufficiency, I'll, I'll come back to both of those. There's some caveats. With pregnancy, we tried to avoid gadolinium in the first trimester. Renal insufficiency, there's some dose reduction, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So how do you go about figuring out the appropriate use? I, I took this from a friend and colleague in radiology, uh, Dr. Fletcher, who's here. And whenever he talks to our residents and fellows, he talks about the name of the game is the right test for the right patient, picking out what's right for that individual. There's a number of resources you can use to try and guide this. This, was a, this is a nice one by the American College of Radiology. If you Google or you go to acr.com, you'll find the site. This was expert opinion. There was a multidisciplinary panel. There were gastroenterologists as part of this. You can put in either the diagnosis or the modality. And what you'll come up with is expert opinion about various modalities in various clinical situations. This one here is an example of Crohn's disease. Um, this is acute initial presentation. A 7, 8, or 9 score over here indicates it's most likely or it's highly appropriate. A 1, 2, or 3 means most likely inappropriate. And you can see in 2011, CT anaerography was a 9, MR was an 8. I, I think nowadays you could probably score both as a 9 in this setting. It also gives you the relative risk or, or the relative amount of radiation exposure from both modalities. How do I put this together for, based on the literature, what are appropriate indications to consider imaging in our patients? I think the first subset is those with suspected Crohn's disease. It helps establish the disease. For me, at times, it helps guide where I'm going to get tissue, particularly in some difficult cases that can guide anterograde versus retrograde double balloon endoscopy, help you define extent as well as severity disease, exclude alternate etiologies, detect penetrating disease, stricture and disease, as well as extraintestinal disease manifestation. While those all hold true for established disease, in addition, you can use these for an objective measure for treatment response, and I'll come back to some of the bone things you can do with these as well. This is an example of lesion remodeling on CT enterography. This was a patient in one of our studies who in 2004 elected to go on monotherapy with anti-TNF therapy. You can see the initial image would be there to your left, and over time, by 2007, you can see almost complete normalization of the small bowel. I mentioned before about other new applications. This was presented at DDW this year, um, and we hope to go online with this in January. And that's the ability to take the CT, for example, and get additional information. You can get DEXA scores from CT now. You can also get bone strength. And bone strength is kind of the new kid on the block. It's what our endocrinologists like, almost all phase one and phase two studies for resorptive agents or some of the osteoporotic medications use CT because of this. And essentially, what is bone strength? It's a measure of the amount of force that has to be applied to the bone to get a fracture. Now, CT has the ability to give you that in addition to other information. And why I think we like it, for CT, the cost of doing this is about $70. A DEXA scan is about $350. There's no extra radiation exposure. It's all post-processing of the images. So there's convenience, there's cost issues, and it may be a better marker overall of bone health, and it may change how many patients we're able to identify or screen for osteopenia or osteoporosis.
So then, how do I image in practice? How do I choose which modality if they have an appropriate indication? To me, MR enterography is often employed, particularly in a younger patient, and to me that's 35 or younger. Serial examinations, renal disease, the caveat being with the gadolinium, clearance less than 60, it's half the dose, less than 30, we normally don't give that. Pregnancy, we mentioned about no gadolinium in the first trimester. And then stricture and perianal disease, those are times when I'll go to MR enterography. There are some examples on the left where I don't use either modality. There's small bowel follow-through, potentially in complex postoperative anatomy. Enterocolysis, either CT or MR can be done, particularly if they've had multiple negative studies and I'm still highly suspicious for a stricture. And then video capsule and ultrasound, I, I do think they have a role. It's not my topic, but just briefly, a capsule is very good for proximal disease. It's very good at looking at the mucosa. I do think eventually we'll see a role for ultrasound in the United States, even though we're not there quite yet. Well, how about misuse then? And unfortunately, I, I think this comes from either the wrong test, the wrong patient, or, or possibly both, the wrong test and the wrong patient. Some examples to me where we get this wrong would be multiple CTs in, in a young patient. I think we can do a better job. MR in the elderly, I think you could argue with me about that, and I put that up there mostly in the United States for cost, knowing that most of the risk or most of the sensitivity is at a young age. The dose of CT, the radiation has gotten smaller and smaller, uh, and there's about a $1,500 difference in cost. So I, I think you can make an argument for CT, particularly in an elderly patient, without renal concerns. CT or MRE are, are not indicated for, the, for dysplasia detection. Uh, MR for inpatient with sepsis or SERS, I, I point that out because occasionally we'll see that on the hospital services where a patient will go through the weekend waiting for MR enterography. If the patient's that sick that you're worried about penetrating disease, I think CT is a better modality, particularly if you can get it quickly. These are ill patients. You're asking them to drink a liter and a half of volumen. Many of them are already nauseous. Then you put them inside a scanner. A CAT scan you can do very quickly compared to an MR where it may take 45 minutes to get the images. Patients with tremor or obese or diabetics where there may be a concern about giving glucagon, all reasons, I think, to think about CT enterography in that setting. And then, uh, again, MR at the bottom, we've talked about this for renal insufficiency in pregnant patients. How about wrong patient? And I'll come back to this. I think we all deal with a difficult setting, not just chronic abdominal pain, but chronic abdominal pain in the setting of IBD can be very difficult. And, and I think our colleagues in the ER need help or guidance on figuring out which patients damage and which patient not damage. So how are we doing if you look at what is the data out there? I think this was a nice study that sought to look at how we're doing, particularly in our younger patients. So this was a look at CT enterography in young patients. Initially, there was close to 7,000 CTs, or 7,000 patients identified who had CT exams. When you break that down, a little more than 2,000 of those were less than age 35. If you follow that down a little bit further for how many had more than one CT, you can see there are about 192 patients. When we looked at those to say, well, young patients, serial CTs, how many would have been appropriate for MR? Didn't have a contraindication to MR, particularly if the indication for the exam was to assess response to therapy, because I think all of us agree that's probably a better role for MR. You can see it comes out to being only 5% of the total number, but again, it's almost 100 patients. And so it's kind of glass half full, glass half empty. We're not doing that bad, but I do think there's room for improvement. Another way to look at this then would be, well, well, if you take the standpoint that there may be some level of radiation we want to avoid, there's some absolute, there's some number that does pretend a certain risk. This is a very muddy science, and I, I won't get into it. I'm happy to talk more after it. But the number a lot of times that people throw out is right around 100 millisieverts as a potential risk, and we try to avoid that as far as cumulative. What you can see from this cohort of population-based study is most of our patients don't. You see the numbers are higher as far as effective dose and millisieverts for Crohn's ulcerative colitis. Not surprising, we image Crohn's patients much more frequently. You can see at the very bottom the percentage from CT, most are from that. But I, I think it's this area here that has us a little bit worried. There is an upper quartile range of patients who do get more radiation, who do overcome or exceed whether that's 75 or 100 millisieverts, and that's the group that I think we want to do a better job on because it tends to be the younger patients.
Well, how about then looking at the emergency room, right? It's a lower hanging fruit. If we could just do a better job there, maybe we could reduce the radiation exposure. There's multiple studies that have looked at CTUs and IBD patients in the emergency room setting. I, I like this one from Jim Lewis's group. It looked at several centers um, over a, a different period of time. And there's a lot of information that you can take out of this study. They looked at different intervals in time, and what they found is, yes, more patients are seen in the emergency room for IBD over time. We see imaging is more frequent. But at the bottom there, POI, POA is perforation, obstruction, or abscess. POA and CD includes uh, urgent non-Crohn's related findings. And it's similar to what I told you before, almost a third, 25 to 30% had these findings. So it's not enough to just sell the message, don't image my patient in the emergency room. We need better ways to risk stratify and tell them which patients should be imaged and which should not be imaged. No, there's several groups that have looked at this. Uh, Dr. Higgins, Dr. Breu, there's various manuscripts out there. I kept a similar theme. This is from the same group that took it a step further and said, well, if we do need to image our patients, how can we make some type of model or risk stratification system to kind of guide who should be getting the images? There's various ways to go about this. They looked at various clinical as well as clinical as well as laboratory features of these patients. And what they found as far as the final model was a history of obstruction, history of intra-abdominal abscesses, uh, current hematochesia, and a white blood cell count of greater than 12,000 were significant. And the way it works is you get a score of one for each of the variables except for hematochesia that you subtract one. And they were able, based on that, to develop who would be a low-risk population that probably doesn't need to be imaged at somebody with a score of minus one. So in summary, I think we've evolved to the point where cross-sectional imaging has become a, a vital part of our practice. It's an objective measure of disease activity. It detects disease that may skip the terminal ileum. It detects uh, intramural disease, penetrating complications, extra-intestinal manifestations. And at the end of the day, it, takes, it, it changes how we take care of our patients. As far as appropriate use, I think the applications continue to expand, but the key is always going to be matching the right patient with the right exam. I was asked to end briefly with where I think the future as far as this topic goes. I think in the next year or two, you will see uh, more publications uh, about predictive models. You'll see increased guidelines to further assess or assist with when patients should be imaged in the acute setting, particularly in acute care emergency room. I, I do think that there may be a role for ultrasound in our algorithms. There's some question, uh, at least for me, about how well it performs for penetrating disease, and that may be a, a particular concern in the emergency room setting where we're trying to limit radiation exposure. And I think in the next year or two, you'll see guidelines from various societies about imaging algorithms. I think we'll see more about what's appropriate or inappropriate, what timelines we should use for imaging, as well as standardization of the reports you get. And, and I think we all look forward to that. Thank you.